everybody. Welcome here to Music City Live. My name is Ryan. I'm your host. Welcome to episode three. I'm here with Bob Reed from Bob Noxious, SFH, and Razor. And uh, so happy to have Bob on the show. Uh, Bob and me go go back, and he goes back with my family. We've, we've known each other for a while. We've done lots of shows together uh, through PA Shop and Bob Noxious and so on. And and there's even some guys in the work here in the building that have, that have been in bands with Bob and done lots of work with them. So I appreciate you coming on, man. Right on, man. Thanks for having me down. This is great. I love your basement. Yeah, dude. It's awesome. Thanks. It is. Thanks. I appreciate it. Um, so, yeah. So for, for those of you that are uh, not familiar with, with uh, Bob's talents, uh, singer, songwriter, guitar player, entrepreneur. Storyteller. Brand, storyteller. <laughs> Tell the best stories. <laughs> That's right. Which we'll get into. Um, so early days. Um, let's get right into it. Early days for Bob. You're from London. From London. Born in Kitchener. Spent the uh, first few months of my life in Oshawa and then moved to London and been here ever since. Cool. And I mean, that's how I, you know, started working with you was here in town on all the festivals and the shows. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, I can't think of and I'm being serious. I can't think of a, a better band to do lights for <laughs> in London, for sure. And, and for that matter, across Canada, because, you know, just the level of energy that you guys bring with your show is huge. Yeah, we're fun. Yeah, imagine that imagine <laughs> that's cool have you so have you you've obviously you said you you were born in kitchener lived here oshawa for a stint lived anywhere else for any periods of time no, no been stuff? a lot of places but uh this is where i crash so yeah man well how, how did you get into music so because i know like the london music scene has changed vastly since the day the early days uh yeah and uh I, I'm, I'm one that can verify uh, I've watched London change over the years and, uh, it's, it's been good and it's been shit. So, I mean, that's, that's rock and roll. So, yeah. uh, you know, very early age, my, my dad was always a musician, played with a lot of cool cats. And, um, he said, you know, piano lessons, boy. And, <laughs> uh, so that's what I did. And he, uh, my parents got me a, uh, set of Bolero drums in grade two for uh -huh. christmas so bang bang crash crash making all the noise drove him insane the thing is, is i think my dad bought the drums more for him oh, yeah. <laughs> than for me but uh so and then i remember in grade six finding an old semi-acoustic kent guitar under my parents bedroom under their bed okay. and um pulled it out and thought oh man so you know you start strumming on it you don't know what the hell you're doing but you, 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 you think you do so you're sitting there playing and the bedroom door opens and there's my dad you put that guitar back and i looked at him like uh you know oh no busted <laughs> and my mom says oh no he gets to play that guitar glenn you bought that for me for my birthday that's my guitar oh, and i looked wow. at my mom like dad bought you a guitar for your birthday yeah go figure so <laughs> i'm looking like, at him like drums for me guitar for, for mom, mom. Yeah, see where and this she is said no nope, that's my guitar go ahead and play it so there i was trying to play you know whatever i could and uh and from there uh, i had this little wee practice amp and it sounded all right but no distortion okay so um a friend at school i think it was grade seven or so um he had a Gaia tone distortion pedal. I don't know if you know what that is, but they're really old and yeah, yeah. We, you know, yeah. really fuzzy. We haven't had one in the store here, but I've seen pictures. <laughs> of them, <yeah>. they're, they're solid distortion with so much feedback. The second you're not playing. Right. <laughs> so I plugged that in and I went from being a hack to the greatest guitar player ever. Right. <laughs> you plug that in and wow, man, this is like first time finding sex. It's like, <laughs> this is amazing. And that's when your guitar gets louder. And that's when you get that little vibe of, holy shit, this yeah, is baby. pretty cool. And uh, a neighbor behind me, Tim Waddingham, he knew how to play guitar. So he started showing me some things, right? And cool. as soon as you learn the things. And so this is grade six. And then one of my, my oldest friend, Brad Geard, he, he played drums. So... We start jamming in my parents' basement, his parents' garage, and next thing you know, other kids whose parents have money are buying them stuff so they can jam along and join in the band. Yeah. We sucked horribly, <laughs> but 
but it was so much fun. And uh, then when I turned 16, my, my dad and my mom said, let's get you a new guitar for your birthday. So I went down to, to Johnny Baloney's. Nice. And uh, yeah, welcome to Balloons. <laughs> Can I help you? How much would you like to pay? And uh, I say that because I know John Jr. would of laugh. Course. So I um, went down there and I got a Stratocaster. Uh, my 16th birthday and um that was basically the start of this journey this journey, the rock <laughs> right. and roll journey yeah i so, did i did do uh six years of piano at public school which i okay. think is is an amazing thing to do if you're thinking about getting your kids started in any kind of music i would suggest piano first if you're looking to get you know drive your wife out of the house or dad out of the house buy them drums <laughs> right <laughs> acoustic drums the loudest ah, ones you can go find. for the loudest drums you can possibly get but uh so that's that's how i started up nice why what what pulled you towards rock well so my dad was in was in bands that were rock okay. and if you heard the music that he played you'd be thinking holy shit like that's how i got into elvis chuck berry and, and all that stuff is because that's what my dad listened to mm. and it, the bands that he jammed in did that and a lot of the guys he had fun with just like all our friends in london are all good musicians and we play he played in kitchener waterloo and hey, there. uh yeah, there it is there and, it is and he uh he would play with some some of the guys that i remember running into ronnie hawkins one day and, and i started naming off some of the names that my dad would tell me and to my astonishment ronnie was going oh my god i haven't heard that name in years <laughs> and i thought this is legit Holy God, like, wow, these guys are, were really good musicians. Wow. And I remember when I was a little kid, my dad one night was jamming in the basement with my gear, even though I was in public school, probably in grade four. And the next morning, my dad says to me at the breakfast table, I'm going to have to get you a new drum kit. My uh, friend Ray, Ray Fennell put his foot through it. <laughs> and when I brought up the name Ray Fennell to, uh, to Ronnie, he was like, I haven't heard that. Wow, he was a great drummer. And I'm just thinking, wow, if Ronnie Hawkins knows these guys. And then my dad would mention some of the guys in the band and stuff like that, that he, you know, grew up in his circle. So I was like, holy shit. So, so was it, so your dad was obviously a huge supporter of what you were doing. Absolutely. Um, he had a, he started a company in, in 1977 selling your urine race, which is what I still do to this day. And um, the cool thing about that was he would say, you want a guitar? work it off so he'd buy me the guitar or he bought me a trainer he didn't have much money but he found a way to make it happen wow. and i'd work it off so i remember in grade six when i first came home my dad said you get we got to get you a trainer now we got to get you an amp so he found it a, a, a used trainer and i remember coming coming walking in the front door of the house my mom goes you got your new amp and i'm carrying the the head but she don't know that right she's like you, you got your new amp i go yeah right here i go and dad's got the speaker <laughs> dad comes walking in with this huge speaker her freaking jaw hit the floor she's like what so that was the start of the loud house yeah <laughs> yeah my dad's been that's super supportive of me too i i get that a lot well you got a little more gear than i could ever have yeah but, i don't even know where half of it is wait, sometimes wait. <laughs> but yeah no it, it's uh it's huge to have that support network man and i mean my mom worked for me for she i was my mom's boss for like you know, 15 years or something like that. You think you were your mom. Well, boss. yeah, you know, we, we made that, we made that arrangement. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, support's huge, man, in, in the early days. And out, so out, outside of your mom and dad, like, did you have support from anyone else? Friends, family, anyone else? Just friends that uh, were into music. I mean, you know, whatever your niche is, you seem to find those people and you just hang out with those people. Yeah, yeah. So I had that, but I also had sports. So I was divided between music and sports a lot especially hockey and um stupidly i choose music so you chose stay with sports <laughs> <laughs> there's way more money in it yeah go, go don't go towards the passionate oh. music career um <laughs> so first band first well i saw there was a picture that there yeah it is. there we go uh a a 17 or 18 there yeah key west scott bentley's first bar um on talbot street <laughs> 85 86 um i wasn't I, I wasn't 19 yet and scott was cool about that <laughs> funny thing was is uh i think sfh has closed every bar scott ever owned 
that one we had to get to the marshal to open the door so we could get our gear out. <laughs> Here's another one. Oh, there we go. There's yeah. there there's Key West. There's my uh, 16th birthday Stratocaster. Wow. Okay, so that's the guitar. And there's the trainer over there with the microphone hanging in front of it. Wow. So you, I... you drove that all the way down to Key West, eh? Oh, uh, well, Key West in London. Oh, okay. so it wasn't I thought, such a far Oh, I thought you were trip. talking about Key West in Florida. Oh, no. That would have been. Well, it was funny because Scotty put pink flamingos and everything around the bar. <laughs> it was definitely London's oh, Key, hottest Key punk. West the bar. The I see. Bar. Okay. All right. Well, you're a, you're a global, you know, guy. Bob, so, <laughs> yeah, know, but not when I was 18. 18. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you, you're on your way. <laughs> Key West the bar, Key West the, the, the town yeah. next. <laughs> Um, that's cool. So SFH was the, was at what time? Like what time? How, and how did that all happen? Like how did SFH even become to be? Cause in public school when I had a band and we sucked, eventually you start to, to, you know, go over the hurdles and realize what you want to do. So at a very young age, I, you know, this is a long time ago, but <laughs> they had little cassette decks, right? Uh, you can get it Sears or something, right? You know, the ones where you push play and record at the same yeah. time, little condenser mic. So luckily for me, my dad had one that had a left and right. Okay. Right. And then I had the single cassette. Long story short, if you record yourself on one tape, push play and then hit record on the other tape, you can play over what you've already recorded yourself. Wow. And now you are recording two <laughs> tracks, two tracks, right? So as soon as I did that and I pushed play on the second, I went, wow, swing. That's pretty <laughs> cool, man. And even though I sucked, I thought that was pretty cool, right? Look, look at what I just did. So doing that, uh, I started to play with other guys. And then you just, oh, you lack on to somebody that's like, wow, we click. And that's what we kind of did with SFH, so. And that's Met the guys. Yeah, go on. Yeah. Oh, well, put up. I we uh, we answered a. Um, there was a little ad of Blones okay. on the wall. Whoosh, rotary phone, and uh, <laughs> that's how I met Richie, basically wow. our drummer. So he came down, and we just got together, and we just started playing, and just got better and better and better. Now it all depends on like. Luckily for us, what we were doing was pretty precise stuff. And when we started to get really good was around the time that Metallica was just putting out Kill 'Em All. Okay. And for me, it was, wow, listen to this. This is like machine gun guitar playing, precise as hell, yet partying. Yeah. Right? Right. And Yeah, they brought that to it. I thought, man, if I can play like that, and that was the album that I really went to to learn how to pick like a maniac, then the next hard thing to do would be sing while picking like a maniac mm -hmm. so i prided myself on being decent enough to do that you know and we said man we, we we should start we should play in front of somebody and so that's what we did cool and it, it all started there scotty gave us our first gig yeah so sfh was from what years wow um 85 86 to 88 and we opened for razor okay oh okay and there's Here we the go. door so um we opened for razor i gave dave um our demo tape cold death and he said uh cool right on and um he wanted a new new singer at the time so mm. he offered me the gig and uh and you took it. <laughs> I took it. <laughs> yeah, no so brainer. So I've been singing in Razor since 1988. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. So then we did our first our first album. We recorded in 89. It came out in 90, uh, Shotgun Justice, which was a pretty fucking heavy album. Yeah. Right? Even today, people are like, wow, man, that's shit. Yeah, that's the shit. So, uh, <laughs> you know, um, I remember my dad opening the door one day and looking at me and going, that music makes me mad. And I looked up yeah. at him and I said, supposed to. That's the point, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah. That's awesome. There's there's some, uh, we got some picks here, right? That's, uh, I think, Germany. Uh, actually, I can say that about almost every, because I don't know nothing. Now, that's definitely not Germany. <laughs> that was... Um, 
Where'd you say, Hesse? Mexico. 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 Sounds better when he says it. The Canadian. There you go. You got the Canadian FM 96 London's best rock shirt in Mexico. It's awesome. I had to. I remember one time calling Taz. We were playing Japan. Don't want to get myself in trouble, but I'm going to. So there we are. (laughs) You know, smoking weed in Japan is not good, right? (laughs) Not good at all. But we did. So in order to do it, you got to be like a little child. Go up. We were up on a rooftop smoking (laughs) a little bit of weed. And I thought, man, I'm going to call Taz. Because it's a total different time zone, right? Totally. So I I called him and he was doing the the morning show. And he thought that was pretty cool that I'm calling him, checking in from Japan, right? (laughs) (laughs) Breaking rules. But yeah, we've played Japan five times. It's a really cool place. Really cool place to play. That's cool. That was one of the first times where we played a show and I realized, fuck, people other than my friends know who we are. <laughs> like, here we are in Japan and look at all these people that come out, two sold out shows, and they're following us through the streets. Okay. That was really our first, uh, that was our first gig in Japan. So, and how many I people were, how many people came out to that show? Each show was uh, like a 900 seater. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. That was pretty cool. Yeah. That is that pretty was a cool. long time ago, but. Yeah, it yeah. just keeps getting bigger and bigger, bigger and bigger time. and bigger. Yeah. There's some, yeah. There's a you, you gave us a bunch of a bunch of pictures there. It looks like there's tens of thousands of people, man. Yeah, so, Razor's pretty big all over the world, so it's pretty cool. I think we've played over 20 countries by now. So how many albums? Is, do you know how many albums Razor has? I don't even know how many albums Noxious has. Jesus, I have to use my fingers. To <laughs> Too busy drinking for that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Cheers. I think each band's got like 10 albums. I don't know. Whatever, it doesn't matter. They're all great. They're all great. <laughs> yeah, once you get up to that kind of number and you got enough hits, you just play. You're playing mostly hits, right? I mean, that's what goggles for, right? Just yeah. Google it, and you'll. Do you uh, do you guys ever do you ever find are you guys like at this stage just with Razor and I mean Noxious? I've seen the setup you guys do a bunch of times, but with Razor, do you guys ever play like some of the B cuts, or do you guys mostly just stick to the hits? Yeah, we we play some uh, off the cuff stuff once in a while, yeah. um, but not too often because we're, I don't know. I guess kind of guys like me are like, fuck, man, more lyrics, really. <laughs> 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 Dave knows them all, but for me, it's like, man, wasn't that from '84? So, but well, we do play a lot of old stuff, man. But that's because we're old. Yeah, yeah, so whatever. No, no. It's all good. It is all good. So that's why I, we get all the thousands of people to come out and see. It. <laughs> yeah, well, it's so. How did you go? How did it go? Like, where did Bob Noxious come in? Well, what happened was is um, at one point, uh, Dave and Razor got got cancer, and he had some issues with his throat, and had to do all kinds of surgery. Blew oh, wow. out his fucking hand. It was horrible, so he couldn't play for quite some time. Oh, and we know. really thought that that we were done. And um, so I, oh, fuck, I gotta do something. So I started Noxious in, in uh, 2000. Okay. And uh, I just started recording shit. And then um, I met Wiley and I, I needed a drummer. Yeah, and uh, it always starts with a drummer. <laughs> it kind of does for me, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So then you know, got Wiley in there, and then away we went. And then- uh, Wiley's awesome. Wiley is awesome. And then I we just Wiley. started um, recording and, and we finished the record. And then we went from there to, well, we need to play this for people. Because that's just the natural progression when you're making music, right? Totally, yeah. Or anything, right? Yeah. You paint your car, you want to go show people your car. Yeah, check out my new paint right? job. You get a new dog and say, hey, look at my new dog. Same with a new baby, whatever. So you make a new song, and then you make a new, and then you make more, and then you make an album, and you go listen to the album at school. You should play a gig. All right. So then we went out and got more guys and started playing, and... You know, started recording. I've always been a guy to do charity work. So right away we started doing charity work. SFH used to do charity work all the time. <clears throat> Not as much as Noxious, my God. I'm sure we've raised over $100,000 by now. Wow. Easily. I, I got to say that. So that was a cool thing. Plan, making money for your, char- for your local charities and your community. I think there's a charity photo there, right? So, you know. If there you're, it is. Uh, Boys and Girls Club. Well, that was a long time ago. Boys and Girls Club of London. Holy crap. 2100 bucks. Look at you there. Yeah. Yeah, baby. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. What year was that? 07? Uh, 09. 09. 07 or 09? Oh, oh, 07. It's 07, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, whatever. You do what you can do, right? Yeah, man. That's that's what you, you do. do. The, you do the Santa Claus parade here every year. Oh, too. my God. I think this 20 years now. Wow, I think really? This is going to be our 20th year. Yeah. Yeah. We didn't even miss. Well, thanks to you guys, too, well, right? Like, yeah, I let's mean, be honest. We, we, we get some help from our friends to pull this off. <laughs> you need a truck. You need gear. We even pulled it off during the pandemic. Remember? We've, yeah. We the drive through, the drive through Santa Claus parade at the airport. The things, the things I've done in Noxious, I, I swear, like, I, I wouldn't doubt if we were the first band to be on a float playing going down a street. Yeah. In, like, in negative 30. <laughs> yeah. Like, we've done the craziest shit I think any bands have done, but can't prove it. But we got a pretty good list of crap. We got pictures we obviously can't show. Yeah. You've seen <laughs> some. I've seen some. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that's always fun. That's yeah, that's man. one thing, you know. And it, you it, start a band for the right reason. It's dedication too. Like, you know, I joke about negative 30, but li literally I remember because I was there with the F96 people on the ground, physically on the ground, because you guys were on stage, but I was out front waving at people at that drive through thing. And it got so cold. The cold was coming through my boots. And I talked to Aaron after the set, because, you know, that particular one, because normally you guys are moving on the float. Which is worse. And normally it's faster, right? Like yeah. It, 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 so there was more time. No, that was, was stupid, because that show took four hours. Right. And they still cut people off. Yeah, and you guys were now, playing like the same three songs. You play, we're playing the same three, three songs, songs for four hours. Can you imagine? No, four hours. so <laughs> I was try crazy. saying a paragraph over and over again for four hours. I guarantee you're gonna get lost. You just your mind just starts to go. Well, I don't even know where I am in the song anymore. <laughs> it was bonkers. It is. At the end of it, I go up to Aaron, and Aaron's like, "I can't feel my yeah, fingers." <laughs> I remember uh, one year when we were going down, um, the microphone stuck to my lips Oh, because it was so cold. So, what the hell are we doing? <laughs> but, you know, it's all good. And for those of you that don't know, the, the, the Santa Claus parade in London is actually at nighttime, which is kind of cool. It used to be during used the day. used to be during the day, but now it's at nighttime. Yeah, yeah, now it's at nighttime, which makes it even colder. Yeah, absolutely. And we sponsor, too. We sponsor Santa. We've been doing that, I think at least 10 plus years now. I don't even know how many I'd have to look, but yeah, we've been sponsoring the Santa flow too. So it's a, it's a great thing, man. The kids love it. I got a couple of youngins now. I'm going to take them, take mine this year. Check it out. And that's the, and that's stop having kids because that's why we keep playing. Cause every year I get somebody <laughs> who says to me, I was a kid and I saw you play in the Santa Claus parade. Now I want to take my kid. Are you playing this year? <laughs> <laughs> yep yeah <laughs> at some point i'm gonna look like santa and i will be the guy in the red chair playing well you well, got the chair now i do have the chair now yeah that's right <laughs> that chair is awesome man <laughs> so so the charity work thing yeah it's it's the charity work thing is cool i mean we you know we do a bunch of that here too at music city we try to you know if people come to us and they're like hey you know can you help us out we try to help out people where we can where did bob noxious the name come from like, is it just something you guys well, just came just, up with? It, it was really obvious because like I always it, get told I'm I'm very obnoxious or very, you know, outspoken. And first name's Bob. So it was kind of a yeah pretty easy given there. And you came up with it? No, I've been called, you're yeah, such a Bob Noxious. I've, you know, over the okay. years, even as a kid, the odd time, somebody would play with words. Ha ha, how clever. So we thought we'd be just as clever and yeah, yeah. go with that, right? Huh. And as far as, you know, I mean, there's lots of, you know, younger guys coming up that are, you know, watching this. You know, one of the things I was curious about, you know, you guys, you know, you've been in Razor since 88, Noxious since 2000. How do you keep bands together, man? How do you stop? We talked about this earlier at dinner, right? Yeah, it, yeah, but you didn't ask the question the same way. No, I know. Now you're asking me how to keep well, them together. What, well, okay, here, I'll rephrase. How, right. Yeah, right. So so what causes bands to break up? There you that go. That <laughs> is something. The other one I don't know an answer to. Yeah, fair right? enough. Um, but I do know the answer to some, some parts of that. There's always going to be some issue, but uh, the main ones are somebody fucks somebody. Mm -hmm. right and that just 
fucks the band up, a chick or a dude. Somebody does something stupid that fucks it up. There's always the money issue. There's the I do more than Johnny does fucking issue, right? Right. And uh, no, John, I wasn't talking about you. I was just using the name Johnny because if I picked anybody else's name, I'm going to get a call as well. <laughs> um, there's um, credits, you know? Yeah. I didn't get a credit for doing that in the song. Just, there's all kinds of stupid reasons why bands break up and um, there's nothing you can do about it. That's just the way it goes. Yeah, I mean, I've seen, I've seen it be tough. Like I, I haven't done a ton of you know band management, but I did a few in different bands over the last bunch of years, and and it's a tough gig, man, to keep for guy, sure guys I mean, and, guys on you know, track. You know, four, five, three guys always stuck together, always doing the same thing, always eating the same shit, smelling the same farts. It gets sometimes I guess it gets on some guys nerves and they can't handle it. You were it. saying at dinner, the, the whole separate rooms thing, right? Well, in razor, we have separate rooms and that's a good thing, right? Like if, if you can do it, I mean, when yeah, not in the early it. age, you know, it's tough to, <laughs> it's tough just to get a gig, let alone have separate rooms, but you know, you, you get tired of everybody's shit. People get tired of me. So yeah. Give that guy his own room and I won't have to deal with him. <laughs> but you're doing it. I mean, you're doing it for the fans, I'm assuming, right? Like the. Well, you do it for the fans, but you also do it because it's, it's, I don't know. Why do, why do you uh, go to the can? Cause you have to. So it's the same thing. If, if, if you really got music in your veins, you do it. Cause you can say, oh, I'm done. But then at some point you're like, I ain't fucking done. I got to go do that. Yeah, yeah, that's what I love doing. So, yeah, die, die hard fans. Well, the fans what's, is what's, the reason you go. What's what's like, the reason you can go? Right, right. Because you know, you can't go if there's no fans. So you go because the fans have made it possible for you to go, and you love doing it. I guess once you hit that realm of this i hate this or i can't do it anymore that's a different story yeah because sometimes like me right now health gets in the way and you're like ah shit i gotta fix something before you know i gotta fix this tire before i can get to the show sure or i'm just gonna be dragging my ass and something could go worse that i can see but yeah am i getting off top no no you're on man no i i I mean, what's well, we are gonna need you're, to make another drink? Yeah, yeah, we, that's all good. Uh, uh, so, what's it like to uh, what's it like to come face to face with like diehard fans? Because I think you were you were telling us a story at dinner about Japan. That's right? a whole new world, right? When you meet somebody who, I mean, I understand because when I was a little kid growing up, I'm still a little kid growing up, but. <laughs> I mean, I was a huge fan of so many, like Kiss mainly, right? So when you finally meet those guys, you, when you finally meet the guy you always wanted to meet, you better hope he's not having a shitty day or his dog died or his wife said, fuck you. Because <laughs> you're going to think that guy's a jerk if that's the mood he's in. Not knowing that, man, his dog died today or whatever the hell happened. Sure. Because we all have shitty days. If you meet a guy on that shitty day, that might be your interpretation of, wow, my idol's such an ass. Hopefully that doesn't happen. Yeah, yeah. For me, it didn't happen when I met Gene and got to open for them. It was great. Paul was like, they were all great. So when I meet these guys, I, I think of that, right? Because I think, fuck, man, who would give a shit to, to meet me, right? And then you, you realize, oh, fuck. I can make this guy's day. Why can't I do that? Right? I can walk an old lady across the street. I certainly can turn around to a fan and go, hey, man, thank you. You know, don't thank me. Thank you. And I've seen some fans that are like pretty freaked out to, to really? meet the band, right? Like, it's just kind of weird. Especially ones like internationally. Like, the, well, that's, are... that's what I really mean. Like, you know, in Japan, we. <laughs> We met some people. I'm like, holy shit, really? And then 
I did, the one I really remember was in Czech Republic where this guy said, wow, man, your album Shotgun Justice, that's 1989, really got me through some hard times. And he was, he was sobbing. Wow. And I just thought, wow, man, how could I not come and play this show? Why would I not do this? Believe me, it sounds like it's all fun and games, but when you have to get on a plane and go through all that shit and through all the airports and all the crap, there is, you, you do all this so that you can get this one hour on stage, yeah. the fun part. And the other parts can drive you nuts if, if you're not in the right peace of mind or in the right game. Yeah, so. Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah, I know you were telling us the story there at dinner about the guy from Japan. I figured there's probably a few of those stories. There's out there. a few of them, yeah. So, yeah, that's make cool. the time to to appreciate your fans because that's what you started to do this for, right? Well, you started to do it because you love what you did. Here's the music. You listen back. You go, wow. Now I got to play it for somebody. When somebody cares about your music and what you're doing, there's even a right. There's that. Ooh, you get a little bit yeah. of a bigger puffer fish there. You start hearing it get a little bit bigger, and then it's like, wow, we got totally. fans. Totally. This is awesome. Yeah. Right? Especially when we didn't know we had all these fans around the world. Yeah. And then we started finding out. It's like, holy crap. So. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. There's, I, there's, I was talking you know, a couple days ago to somebody about, you know, uh, this sort of false sense of success that some of these artists, these early artists have with going on social media and, you know, getting a ton of likes on social media and thinking, wow, you know, we're doing great. We're so successful. And then I was telling you, I'm not so sure the bank manager cares about likes, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> or the promoter for that matter. Right. <laughs> or the promoter. If, yeah, if you get the gig because of likes, that might be a problem. Yeah. Well, you go online, you know, you put up a cool fancy video that your buddy shot on a couple of iPhones and you get, you know, a few tens of thousands of likes and, you know, maybe somebody thinks that you can do more than you can do. Right. But that's that's what I was going to say. Like I said it at dinner is, you know, one of the things that I am trying to put out there is that, you know, I wouldn't measure as an early a band early on. I wouldn't measure your success out of your Instagram or your, you know, or your social media. I would measure it based on how many butts you can put in seats, you know. And and so, you know, well, it, it's a double edged sword because, OK, I don't know that guy who just put that banjo tune out and now he's oh yeah 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 that guy's okay blowing up well, all those likes could make him a lot of money right now oh yeah right totally but he right. put out a song good like at the right time and it's gone viral right luck of the draw sure totally so with all those likes now he's got offers for millions of bucks so it it, it if you're okay and how many times does that happen so right, exactly there's always a shot in the dark yeah but there's always that sure right? sure sure but what you're saying is nobody fucking cares really right they care for now a couple days from now ah they're on to the next thing so you better have some substance to what you're doing that guy what he's playing he feels real about it and i love yeah. the fact that he turned down all the dough i think that's really cool yeah but um yeah, I, you really should just make music for the same reason he did. Because he wanted to. He felt he had to. Yeah. You don't make music to be a rock star. You don't, because 20 years from now, nobody might have given a shit. And when you listen to your song you recorded how many years back, you want to still enjoy it. You want to go, that's what I felt like, and that's what I did. And that's why I did it. Not all, you know, this week, this is the flavor of the month because this is what everybody's listening to. Well, I can do that. Mm, wrong reason. Wrong yeah. reason. Do it because you want to push play yeah, for yeah. yourself first. And then when you go, holy fuck, the hair on my arms just stood up. I got to play this for somebody else. And they'll let you know what they think and so on and so on. And then the buzz starts. And then if you want to take it from there, you take it from there. Yeah. That's the creation like, of the art. Definitely side of make music for yourself. Yeah. Unless of course you're getting paid to write jingles. Then. Well, that's a whole well, other thing. A whole other fucking thing. Yeah. Or you're selling out arenas like the Wiggles. Or the Wiggles. Yeah. <laughs> They're amazing. Unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. The jingle, the, the, the jingle, jingle king there. Oh man. 
Yeah, Anthony's got it down, that's for sure. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, I mean, so, you know, that's what I was, I guess, yeah, getting at was, you know, I think that uh, I did a conference like back in, uh, was it 20, when would that have been? 2016, I think maybe in Toronto, I was hosting a conference there. And one of the guys from the UK from a record label just said, you know, he said like, there's people in the UK that want to, that want to put all their passion, just like you're saying, put all their time, all their passion into music, but they got to have a day job. And with the cost of living continue to go up and up and up and up, it gets harder and harder you got to get two jobs and three jobs and it's harder and harder to find the time to even write music, let alone put a whole band together and rehearse. Right. Cause you got all the, all your time is being vacuumed by these other things. Now you find a way, right? If that's what you want to do. Yeah. You find a way. Yeah. Right. Excuses are excuses, but you find a way. Usually you find a way to not go to work because I'm staying home. I might pretend I'm sick, but I'm staying home to record because I got this idea. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's and then one the, And then the tape recorders come out. Yeah, the tape recorders <laughs> come out. Yeah. So at dinner, we were talking about I, my thing about, you know, there not being a clear path to success versus other things that young people can do. There is never a clear path. That's just ridiculous. Yeah, I was going to say. I don't care what it is you're doing. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You got to work for it. And again, the cool thing is, unlike, let's say, trying to become a professional hockey player. You can work for it, but at the end of the day, all you've got is your trophies that you've accumulated and you didn't get to the NHL. You had a blast right on. Good for you. When you're 50, your knees are going to, that's great. But in music, at least you can push play and listen to it. Right? Yeah, right. For me, it's, it's like, it's cool to show off a trophy or a medal, but if you can play a song for somebody and go, man, yeah. I'm broke and I did all that and it took me this and I didn't go to work and I lost my wife and then my dog ran away, but this is the song I made. And if there's other people in the same boat, they'll go, man, I really like that song. And that gives you a feeling of, yeah, because nobody's going to go, wow, I really like that metal you got. Yeah. They don't understand the, the metal. They just see the metal. They don't, they don't feel the same way as you do. So if you can write a song that can connect with somebody, that's a special thing. Nah, that's cool. So speaking of which, um, songwriting and, and gear is kind of, you know, I mean, I got a whole store full of gear here. Um, your guitar, your guitar of choice. What is it? Oh, my V. Yeah. Yeah, it weighs nothing, which is a godsend to a guy with, fucked up hips and <laughs> problems like that. So it, it doesn't weigh nothing. Um, and it's a really awesome guitar. I can, I can walk from outside to inside or vice versa. And it doesn't go out. It, it slightly goes out of tune. It's, hey, there it is. it's amazing. Yeah. That's a great guitar. Um, funny story about that guitar. I remember we were opening for kiss and, and Gene comes walking up behind me. I didn't know he was there, but as soon as he started to speak, I knew, his voice sure and i hear a voice say well that's a lovely oh what do you say well that's a lovely thing can i touch it <laughs> and i turn around and he looks at me he goes i mean the guitar <laughs> and I thought, that's great of course gene you can play my guitar so he started playing he goes this is a really nice guitar i said thanks it doesn't weigh nothing yeah i know so that was uh that was kind of fun for me. That's cool. To watch Gene jamming on it. But I got that in nineteen eighty eight. Um got it from Washington. Oh really? So, yeah. Got it sent in from Washington. And uh man, I've been playing that uh, ever since, except for one time we were on uh, a Canadian tour, Razor, and <laughs> someone broke into my house and stole it. No. And the bastards didn't have the balls to at least take the case so i get the phone call we've been broken into your guitar is gone oh geez oh yeah that's the worst holy fuck so when i got back to london i started putting the word out like someone's gonna someone's gonna die right and it went bing 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 down the channel to the last guy i got it back <laughs> it was in sarnia about to be painted 
Wow. Yeah, I wasn't pulling any punches back from that one. It was like, okay, we're not messing around here. I want this thing yeah, back. Well, yeah, and no it doubt. came back, and thank God it did, because I I don't know. Yeah, I I, I, I can't even. I can imagine. play it in the dark. <laughs> Blindfolded. Turn the lights off. I don't need, just turn the lights off. I, I I don't need to look at this thing. That that's that's the thing, right? Play your instrument, and this is what SFH used to do. We used to jam so much that some of our jams we turn the light out. Oh, really? To jam in the dark, because there's gonna come a point when you're on the stage, and you're in the dark, and you're in the dark. Yep. And you got no light. I'm a lighting guy, so I can't can, see. I can. I can contest this. You're gonna go. Oh, you hear me? Fuck up there. Yeah, I couldn't see my guitar. Watch Gene when he's playing the bass. He never looks at it. Never oh, looks at yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Right? So, yeah, you can play. Hey. But can you play without looking at it? Yeah. Can you play? Right? Can you play in you the dark? Healy, right? Holy shit. Yeah. Yeah, that's incredible, right? You know? I got his wah pedal. I got his wah pedal Do downstairs. You? Yeah. yeah. Uh, but, but anyway. But yeah. Jam in the dark. Once you get think your band's good, turn the lights off and jam in the dark. And the 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 guitar. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. I essay, I think we need a drink reload here. Uh-oh. <laughs> we need a drink reload. Um so the the V goes into uh, uh I I I called the uh, Spock. Is it Spock? Yeah. Is that what you call him? Yeah. I called him and I and I said, Hey, what's the what's the what's the V go into in the rig? What's the rig run down there, bud? And he's like, uh, it's a it's JMP one hundred. 100 watt JMP. So it's the V directly into that, which is really cool. I mean, there's so many iconic people that have played on JMPs, right? It's clean. Yeah. It's a clean Marshall distortion sound. A lot of guitar players don't like it because it shows every flaw. You can't hide mistakes behind it from distortion. Yeah. And, uh, but for me, it's like I grew up on listening to. ACDC, Judas Priest, Kiss, like all that stuff. And I'm kind of in that realm of sound that I like. Cool. Crisp and and clean. I told you I'd tell you after. So this is the part where I'll tell you. So the, the head that's behind you mm-hmm. um, was, uh, I, I picked it up. It was a gift actually to him, uh, as I come to understand. Um, from so that amp was the number one. I actually have photos that we'll we'll put up uh, of of the original owner. Uh, they're not in the files, I say, but we'll I'll get them to you. The original owner uh, was Gordy Johnson from Big Sugar. <laughs> mm-hmm. So that was Gordy's number one amp uh, f- f- during the early '90s years of the Big, does he know Big you Sugar. Got it? He does know I have it. Okay. Yeah, he does know I have it. I actually tagged him. We posted uh, the picture of me and the guy. He, he doesn't want it back? No, no. He's good. <laughs> he's good. Okay. That, that thing's not light, you know. <laughs> he's got he's to lug it around what, still. Gordy said to me one time, because we've played with, with him lots of times, he said, Bob Noxious, that's the greatest punk band name I've ever heard. <laughs> like, Thanks. <laughs> I got a great picture of Gordy somewhere. He, uh he uh he called me a, a genesis lighting guy because i was always moody, <laughs> moody with my lighting scenes <laughs> yeah turn the lights turn it on white and leave yeah, it on leave the whites <laughs> i'm the same way i like the whites yeah totally i love the white so that amp was gifted by him to john angus from the trues and ja sold it to me cool i picked it up from him so yeah it's a it's a piece of history and so you know we've got a few of those here i got a an amp in the studio from Mike Turner from Our Lady Peace. I got Healy's wah pedal. So we're kind of, we're kind of, you know, this is the the place where these pieces can come and live. And, and if people want them back for an album, they're more than welcome. Uh, but you know what? My thing about it is like, I don't want to see the story like take off. Right. Cause if you know that those things sometimes can get sold to the wrong person and all of a sudden they don't know what it is or who's it is. I don't buy is. gear to sell it. No. Right. No. I, I, I Like if you look at my guitar, if yeah. you ever saw the back of it or just the front of it or the neck, most people look at me like, that's disgusting. I'm like, well, she likes it like that <laughs> because she works. Yep. Right. I, I'm not, Don't I'm not it. looking to have some sort of cool shine come off the chrome and look at the, you know, the flashback from the lights off. No, no. She wants to work. She wants to drink. She wants to party just like me. And that's what, that's how I treat it. I'm not going to sell it. So 
just like my pickup truck. Kick the shit out of it because that's what it's for. Yeah. Right? I'm not, oh, looky here. Oh, no, no. Right? When people pick it up, they go, holy, this thing's got some miles on it. Yes. Just like under my eyes. Got some miles there. And it's worth every wrinkle you get. So I don't polish all my guitars like most people do. I know Bungie, when he picks it up, he's like, Ew. Don't touch it. And I'm like, hey. Don't clean it. That's all work right there, man. I earned every bit of that. <laughs> Change the sound. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. So from from so the gear obviously played like the, your sound, like the gear makes you helps to make you your sound, and then you have your sound. But you know, I was talking to someone the other day and they're like, you know, songs are king, man. You know, I mean, you know, you can you can be the best entertainer out there, but you got to have hits, you know, you got to have things that can stand on two legs and you got a lot of hits. I mean, what is, what was some of your inspiration for writing some of the stuff that you wrote? <laughs> um, there's a lot of like, okay. So all you need to do is step outside and listen and you can hear things that if, if you focus on it, like birds, for example, okay. They, I've got some pretty cool sounds, meaning the way they whistle or however you want to, whatever they're doing. Yeah. Um, some make notes and, and things, you know, and I just click into stuff like that. Wow. Or listening to Sesame Street when I was a kid and stuff like that. Like I was saying earlier, Twinkle Twinkle Little Star is A, B, C, D, is blah, 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 sheep. There's a reason because it's awesome. Yeah. It's just it's ear candy, right? So that's why you know Chuck Berry and the Ramones, very similar, but not depending on what time you were looking at this. Right? Totally. It's it's great. It's not Frank Zappa, right? <laughs> yeah. It's it's like, oh my god, these guys only know three notes. Yeah, but look at how they do all these three notes. It's pretty cool. Yeah. So um some people like the obvious and some people don't. So it's hard to say what's a hit. So I don't know. Yeah. Well, yeah. Cause music you know, and sound is all relative. Usually right? the most hits are knuckle dragging music, right? Okay. Unless you're queen writing something that's like, Holy shit. What the hell is that? Rock you know, opera. <laughs> right. But then again, one of their biggest songs is another one bites the dust, which is so simple. Yeah. Or we will rock you where there's no music at all. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Sing along. I don't know. <clears throat> it's what's catchy and just, but again, don't try to write a hit. Yeah. That's a mistake. Okay. You know, elaborate. What do you mean? Um, I don't know. For me, if, if I said, okay, I'm going to sit down and write a hit. Why? It's that, that's you, you write what you feel or how you feel at the time. And right. if just, you know, for me, the simple, the simplicity of children's nursery rhymes and, and that type of thing, right? Chuck Berry falls into the same thing. It's just like, na -na 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 -na. and well, hell yeah, right? If it's catchy to somebody else, then it probably chances are it's catchy to someone else as well. And it just sort of goes because it's a norm. Sure. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's cool. Yeah, that's really. And if someone writes inspiring. shit, then it's like, oh, why'd you go there? And they'll look at you like, what do you mean? It's like, okay, you don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't have gone there. So, but that doesn't mean anything. Again, always write for yourself, though. Do you write with other people? Not much. I do write with Dave sometimes, but again, him like me, it's like, here's the song. This is how I felt. This is what I did. You know, don't fuck with it. Because this is how I felt. Got it. You know, or they'll say, somebody could say, you got an idea? Anything else to add to this? Not change this, but add to this? That comes in. I don't play with guys like Queen, who, who the hell am I to say anything about those guys? Like, yeah, yeah. You know, it's like, way beyond <laughs> anybody's doing so i don't know 
I'm probably just sounding like an idiot, but musicians will know what I'm talking about. No, yeah, you, no, you, no, you play just... what comes out of you. Yeah. Right. Now, speaking of which, do you play, do you come up with a melody on the guitar first? I used to just write lyrics first. Okay. You know, I do the same actually, thing, actually, I've written a lot of tunes just sitting on the shitter. <laughs> when I was go. a kid some people are reading magazines when you're writing kid, songs <laughs> not now but when I was a kid I'd write you know sit down and write shit on the shitter because you can think nobody's bugging you right um, who cares a lot of times when I was when I was uh, in SFH and I was driving up riding on my bicycle I'd put a quarter in the payphone and call my my house so I could leave a message oh wow and i would hum the hum what just came into my head here's the <laughs> melody or here's the one line right what this one line's pretty cool right a lot of times when i was a kid i'd sit on the bus and the bus would make a drum beat really yeah especially when you go over railway tracks oh yeah you get a and, and i hear those things and i would go man that was pretty cool and I, you know, remember it. And now, you know, we all walk around with cell phones. Jeez. I I can just imagine how many musicians out there walk around and go, blah, 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 into their phone. Totally. Right? Just like you used to call call just from the like pay phone. Call home. <laughs> the answering machine. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Where do you, do you have a particular place that you like to write? I like writing in the shack. Yeah. I've done that. You know, I've had three shacks now and... When I move and the shack comes with me, it gets put back almost exactly the same. So a lot of times somebody, it, I mean, I haven't changed shacks in 23 years, but when I did get to the new shack, people would walk in familiar with the old shack and say, did I just time warp? I'm, I'm, <laughs> I swear I'm in the same place, right? Uh, I like that. I, I like, for me, writing in the dead of winter is awesome because, especially after a storm. Okay. Because nobody's calling and nobody's knocking on the door. There's nothing worse when you're trying to come up with something. I don't care if it's music or whatever you're trying to do. Yeah. And you get on the door. Gone. Because you want to be on this planet, not this planet when you're writing. You want to be in your world doing what you're doing. And whatever bridge you need to get there, you know, cool. But coming back can be really quick. And all it takes is a knock on the door. Yeah, and it's gone. And yeah. sometimes it's gone forever too. Right. Yeah. You know, especially if you didn't call your, your <laughs> message machine. And, oh yeah. I forgot, man. I had this greatest idea. No, it's gone. So from a musical standpoint, uh, is there artists or, you know, I mean, you talked about your dad, um, you know, and, and all of those sort of, you know, artists, but is there artists that really inspired, inspires your music? Well, yeah, but anything I hear that I like would, come into play right but growing up um 50s music was huge for me because my dad would play it all the time and then um the only access i had to music was his cassettes okay and his albums mostly cassettes so like me when i was a kid anybody who was my age and had cassette decks they'd make their own playlist sure. right so i listened to his playlist and you know, I got, I got all the rock stuff. Everything from Beach Boys, Jan and Dean, to Elvis, Chuck Berry, Big Bopper, like Buddy Holly, blah, 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 right? So all that. And he had Muddy Waters and he had, all, like, just, my God, Beatles, and right? And then the 70s came along, like, later 70s, and I started, you know, listening to my own shit. And um, I like the fuzz stuff. So I, like, Deep Purple, I like yeah. Kiss, Black Sabbath, even Zeppelin and whatever, Aerosmith and just the stuff. Then I started to get into when the when the 80s came along, or actually, I guess, late 70s, Ramones, Motorhead. Motorhead changed things for me because double pedal. Ah. Oh, here we go. Yeah. Which to me, I always called the train beat. Yeah, there you go. Fuck, I love Back that. to your earth elements oh again. Oh my god, I love that beat. I love that so much. Yeah. And uh and then when I heard Lemmy's bass all distorted, I thought, fuck, this is this is fucking awesome, right? Yeah. So uh 
then the early 80s came and you got speed metal started to come in like metallica slayer razor and all that shit and i was just like "Ooh, a lot of people don't like this because they don't get it right right they, just, they don't they don't get it it's way above their like, oh god what's happening there <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, this is awesome but i like yeah, i'm sure there's people that said that about zeppelin and sure. all kinds of stuff too well right? let's put it into perspective back when i was a kid and the music i was playing it was either devil's music satan's music rubbish crap shit you know what they call it now classic rock <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's entire corporations that have radio stations based on I, you it. You know, when I was a kid <laughs> listening to all this stuff, you you know you know what's funny? You put on a sports event like hockey or football. What do you usually hear? What are they usually playing? Yeah, classic rock. Yeah, totally. Heavy stuff. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah, totally. You don't hear ABBA, which I, ABBA's got great hooks. Oh my god. But you don't hear certain genres. You don't hear country. You don't hear, right? It's it's the stuff that makes you do this. Yeah. Right? Yeah, it pumps people up. Yeah. Thunder. Right? Yeah, totally. Like, come on. You know? Absolutely. Metallica, you know, Queen. Like, yep. stuff that rocks. Yeah. You know? Sure, they could play Shania Twain or something, but it won't have the same effect. No. People sing along, but it won't amp them up. It doesn't, yeah, it doesn't give you that. Yeah. I'm going to kick some ass right now. Yeah. Which you need, you know, especially if you're in, you know, and you're in the third period, <laughs> you're down, you know, and something about music, man. That's, that's, that's why they say music is a universal language because it is, it affects everybody in a different way. Totally. Right. You know, you can have, I mean, and you've experienced this for real. I mean, I talk about it quite a bit. I, uh, when I was doing my music conference, but you've experienced this where you literally go to a country where some of the people probably don't even speak English. Yet, yet everyone, thousands of people are rocking out Jap in, in unison. In Japan, man. Right? They're singing. I don't even know if they know what they're singing. <laughs> but they're singing the lyrics. Yeah. And it's like, wow, this is awesome. It's, it goes back to what you were saying about the earth elements, right? Going out and listening to the birds. Like the birds don't think you're writing a rock song from, their, from what they're doing. Right? I never thought about what the birds think. And I just think, <laughs> wow, that's a pretty cool riff. But it's but it's the same thing with pe with those other people. It's it's the the melody, right? For that the birds that you do, it's all universal. That you're right. It's 100 percent universal language. Absolutely. Right. And that 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 those melodies, that energy, just moves moves us all. Yeah, it's part of the planet, right? Yeah. Man. If anybody thinks that you come up with something and you're a genius at in this point in the game, come on, you heard something somewhere. And lucky stars for you somebody channeled this through you and you came up with the song and holy shit that sounds great yep did i write that hell no <laughs> where'd it come from i don't really know <laughs> just came out yeah they, people say that you know some of the best hits ever came out in like five or ten minutes right boom just like that right it's like, right. like magic right <laughs> right they yeah. don't know where it came from like i just wrote, wrote it in 10 minutes those are the usually the, the fun ones to play yeah yeah, and the and the the ones that everyone like the we will rock yous right like the ones that are like, you know everyone sings along with and stomps their feet too and it's it's a party, right? It touches something. Yeah, totally. So what? I mean, you guys, you know, with Bob Noxious, I mean, I've I've obviously heard you guys play a pile of times, done lights for the show. What uh, what would you say are a couple of like for people who are watching the sh watching the show? that want to go online, check you guys out. Like what are a couple of your bigger hits that you guys have done that you, that, like, what's your favorite song? Bob Knox. You song. know what? That's like asking, what's your favorite, food? what's your favorite song to play? Holiday man attraction, rock the monster on a front. Okay. Yeah. 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 Rock the monster is a cool track. Right? Yeah. Well, you, you just, that tune and main attraction have that arena thing. Yeah. Right? Okay. Cause there's, yeah, yeah. when we play razor in big places and you're playing that fast, it's sometimes hard to get the definition of that. Right. Right. That's why ACDC in arenas is it's amazing because it's distinct. You could still hear it and it has this vibration that works. The faster you play, 
you get more noise, right? Yeah, yeah. Breaks so up. when we play Rock the Monster, our main attraction for me, especially with me and Wiley, used to, we always used to look at each other like, like hair raising on your arm yet? Because it just has that, that feel of, holy fuck, that sounds great. And that's a high that just, I don't know, you can't bottle that. And I wish you could, because man... I don't know how what to compare it to because yeah. I've never won the Stanley Cup. I don't know what if it even compares. You I know? don't even know. Yeah. But man, there's something about that, right? Yeah, totally. Yeah, I know exactly what you're saying. I, for me, I had a conversation uh, years ago with uh, a guy named Stonebridge, who's a DJ and uh, older DJ, and uh, he'd been in the game a long time. And we were having dinner. It was like twenty. I want to say 2012, I think it was. And I had a music conference in Toronto and, and a couple other guys with us, Nick, who was on episode one and, and a couple other guys. We were, talk, we were at dinner and we we're talking and uh, it just came up. I said, you know, like the best is the energy, you know, the connection with the crowd, you know, and, and nothing, there's nothing like it. There's nothing like that, that energy and that connection when you, when you put that music out there. And for me at the time, I mean, I was playing small rooms and big rooms. It didn't really matter. Um, I just knew when, when that energy was there and that connection was there and everybody was in unison, it was like, there's nothing like it. Nothing, there's no food. There's no sex. There's nothing like it as far as I'm concerned, even to this day. It's a different thing, right? So, um, when somebody says, I really enjoyed what you just did, it makes you feel good. Yeah. When everybody starts joining in, I don't care if it's five people or 5,000 people, because let's be honest, when you're playing... To five thousand people, you know, you can only see the first twenty rows anyway, right? So it doesn't yeah. really matter, like whatever. But there is a there's a feeling in the house. Oh yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. And that's a cool that's a cool vibe. Yeah, man. Yeah, it's totally cool. So, a couple of songs that I wanted to touch on. Um, one was EOA. Mm -hmm. um, for those people that are watching that don't realize EOA stands for East of Lund East of Adelaide, mm -hmm. right? Um, which I grew up East of Adelaide. Mm -hmm. You're currently living East of Adelaide. Um, I love the lyrics in that song. I think it's because I grew up, so I know exactly all those lyrics and, and yeah. what they stand for. It wrote itself. It wrote itself. And it's funny because when you said about the list, listening, like when you when you just said like, oh, you just go outside and listen, right? And then. So well, the first thing I knowing that now and then listening to that on, sirens ripping and neighbors fighting and screaming and yelling and people calling their dogs louder than they need to. And which I'm sure is like any other city that has, you know, more than a hundred thousand people. You're going to hear these things. Yeah. But there's something about East of Adelaide that is not like West of Adelaide. It's a hundred percent. And I just felt like I just needed to get that out off my chest at the time. Yeah. And uh, I remember when we were right, when I wrote the lyrics, the, the look on people's faces, but it wrote itself. Yeah, it totally did. You know, like when I had CTV, cause it became this big thing, right? When CTV came to the shop doing an interview and stuff. And I looked at it and I said, Look across the street, what or in the field there? What do you see? She goes, "I see a shopping cart." I, said, I didn't put that there. <laughs> it's just there. <laughs> like these things are, they write themselves, right? Like yeah. sometimes you don't really need to go too deep. <laughs> you just need to look outside. No, but it's, a song. I didn't even like because I've heard you play that song a pile of times. But now listening to you say like, "Hey, just walk outside and listen," that was the first song I thought of when you <laughs> said that. I'm like. Yep, there you yeah, go. There There's it is. the epitome of it. That's right. <laughs> and what was the inspiration for, I mean, we, the, the obvious, but like what surrounded the writing of uh, Big Cannons? I don't have any idea, man. No. Just for the fun of it. It was. A, it's a fun tune. Yeah. I remember the time you guys got the, the uh, CO2 cannon from us. Remember that? Oh, yeah. That was a long time ago. So the, our very first show, when we played Big Cannons and, and we shot off the cannon, you know yeah. what we did? No. We had 101 joints in the cannon, <laughs> and we shot it off <laughs> at the bar. 
And it was called The Office. Oh, was it? Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Actually, I think he got the uh, first uh, the first poster of, of Bob Noxious. Oh, yeah. Essay. You got that? Yeah. In the in the, in the the images? <laughs> and uh, Is that so, where it was from? It was called The Office? Yeah. Oh, really? So we went. Under branding essay. We, we shot it off and 101 joints go flying out of it. Now, of course, this is back when oh, no, this was illegal, <laughs> of course, you know probably would have called it distribution but it was a, f- a friendly gesture there we go there it is it was pretty funny because people were pulling joints out of their drinks at the bar oh that's hilarious. they just went sailing everywhere it was kind of funny. why 101 because it's one more than 100 it's <laughs> awesome one because 100 too obvious <laughs> and one that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. It was, so that that poster was that was that oh yeah, it was called the office. Yeah, that was uh, two thousand and one or two or something like that. Wow, it was a long time ago. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Um. So. I mean, we know you've already touched on this a bunch of times, but like, um, why music? Like, why did you get into music, and why sh- why do other people sh- get into music? Do you think? The same reason why people do what they do, because they want to. Yeah. That's what they like. And that was it. Yeah, and you just stuck with it. There was none, there was nothing else. I can't. I cannot. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. I cannot. Yeah, you're pretty passionate, man. I mean, even when you perform, you can. And it's funny when you say like, you know, when you're talking about the piece about you know Gene not looking at his bass. I'm as you're saying that I'm remembering you performing looking out playing and you're not looking down either hell no right can't do that (laughs) (laughs) can't do that i'm not playing i'm not alex lifeson i don't need to look at my guitar (laughs) playing what i'm playing come on fuck what uh so as far as you know i mean obviously when you joined razor razor was already kind of you know doing their thing but Bob Noxious in 2000, you know, when you got things going, like what role, because obviously, you know, we're seeing, you know, you wearing T-shirts of F96 down in Mexico, things like that, that we saw earlier. Um, what is, you know, you calling Taz from Japan? <laughs> obviously, radio had a, a big impact promotionally on on what you did with Bob Noxious. How do you think that that, you know, today and into the future, you know, where do you see radio in terms of its relevance? And it's, oh, it's, man, that's a tough question because, um, <laughs> if you think that you can just walk in, up to a radio station and go, here's my tunes. Can't wait to hear it. That's just not going to happen. Right. Yeah. Right. Especially genre versus, uh, format. Right. Yeah. So again, Write songs that you want to hear. Do what you can, right? But the main thing is also um, be important, not just because of your music, but for me, it was I got to help some people. Why? Because we can. Right. Right. Yeah. Because we can. It just so happens the tunes are fun, and they're and some people like it, some people don't, and that's good can't if everybody liked your music well, i don't know who you are right even lots of people hate the beatles funny thing is, is i can actually say to some people i think we have more people that hate our band than like your band <laughs> <laughs> so do something yeah right, right? do something <laughs> so i don't know if, if people understand what i mean by that but do something. Yeah. Because you can, right? Make a difference. Not just playing music for yourself, because that's where you start. But once you can do something, do something. You know? Yeah. I, I It blows my mind that some of these huge bands don't make more money for charities than lining their pockets or their agents or the, you know... I don't want to name some because <laughs> I, I just, uh, but 
seriously, like do something, right? Yeah. You can help and do it. And it also makes you feel good. And even if like back in 95, 96, um, SFH did got covered, covered album where I got a whole bunch of my friends in London to, to uh, do the vocals over what SFH played the music. We played cover tunes and a whole bunch of people from around here did uh, the vocals and we did a big show and FM 96 was part of that. That's a long time ago. And um, we raised money for sick kids. Oh, that's cool. Right. And um, just like when we did the Sasquatch. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, we've raised over with the help of of Larry Summers over at Home Hardware on Hamilton Road. We've raised over fifteen thousand dollars for the local hospital, just wow. by selling shirts, all because we went, yeah, we can do that, right? Yeah, that's cool. Even though it sounded stupid, you're gonna what? Well, we're gonna build a statue of Bigfoot and put it out front of Home Hardware. Why would you do that? Because we can. How are you gonna pay for that? Well, we're not. All of London, whoever wants to donate five bucks, put their name on a thing, they're all, everybody's going to feel good, and there we go. Yeah. Right? It's pretty cool. I drive by it every day. It's going to pick so up awesome. Yeah. You know? And it just, if you got an idea, just try to make it happen and help other people. And it's a cool sense of promotion too, right? Well, like you're, like, it's, it's, it's half of being that guy that just wants to be the, you know, I want to be heard, right? But the other half is, I want to be heard, but I can also help. Yeah, give back. Yeah. You know, you don't need to take on the world. Take on your own backyard. So, like you, so you, and we'll get into the, the, the branding piece in a minute, but like, um, what are some of the things other than the, um, uh, other than the, uh, radio and, and involvement with f96 and the charity stuff is there anything else from a promotional standpoint for you guys that you think has worked because i mean you guys got some pretty solid branding yeah but again we um we we made you say brand but really we just we made the jeans that people wanted to wear some okay. people wanted to wear right, yeah. not everybody right and and that that was just an outlet for people who felt the same way. So find your niche and do that because there's other people that feel the same way as you and they will come. Yeah. If it, but they have, they have to hear it. So today's thing, I mean, back when I was a kid that we didn't have the internet, there's a pros and cons to that, right? Like now everybody can be a rock star. Who's to, to say they're to not? Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. And um, just because you uploaded something. Back in my day, you there was no uploading. No. You had to send it out physically. You had to put a stamp on it. You had to write down something and it wasn't just one click and done. You had to send out 300 fucking albums or CDs. Or cassettes. With a, with a cover or cassettes or and a cover letter and do all the shit. And then you got in a van and you called other bands and you made it happen. It's a little easier now, but it's not as easy because there's more. Way more. Exponentially right? more. Yeah. So You're a little when there's 4,000 different types of cheeses to try out there and you don't know which one to try. Yeah. It, it makes it a little difficult, right? Yeah. So I don't know how to answer that. Cause that's not my world. I mean, if you want to like do your thing, great. Yeah. As long as when you go to bed, you feel good about it. When you wake up, you play your tune again and you, you know, and, and make sure it, when you're in the studio and you're recording something, make sure it's what you want. Cause if you go, ah, that's good enough. No, it ain't. If your line is that's good enough. No, it ain't. Cause 10 years from now, when you're listening back to it. You're going to go, Wish I fixed that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So fix it. Yeah. Totally. You know, do it right. Cause again, it always comes down to everybody could be gone in 15 years and you're the only one left standing there holding your album. Do you like it? Yeah. And that's, that's more important than, you know, I made this song so I could get laid. I made this song so I could, nah, 
Uh, make it so that 20 years from now, 30 years from now, three weeks from now, you go, yep, that's how I wanted that to come across. And nothing's ever perfect because, you, you know, most songwriters will tell you, yeah, you got to get to a point where you let it go. You just got to let it go because you can just keep overworking it mm -hmm. to the point where you fucked it up. I've done that. Because you took the real out of it. You polished it too much. Now it's fake. Yeah. Right? That's why, like, Ramones off the floor is so Ramones off the floor. <laughs> right? Yeah, totally. Because there's the vibe of that. And I think, you know, one of the things that's cool, um, and there's kind of some synergies between this and what you do with this and what we do, is... Um, you know, through being yourself and just writing your own tunes for you. Yeah. You've attracted, you know, all of these people that just vibe with what, with what well, you want. Well, how could I right? not <clears throat> when I'm influenced by the people I'm influenced? Yeah. Who then themselves have millions of followers. So when, if somebody said to me, hey, you guys suck, I'm like, okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> then I don't think you have these bands in your collection at home because clearly you can tell where these songs have come from. And those bands themselves have a story of clearly you can hear where we got our influences from. Yeah. And it just goes ding, ding, ding. Unless you're a piano player who can't hear and you're writing music back in the 18th century, that's a god. <laughs> right? Yeah, no doubt. So that's another level. Yeah. Like, totally. that's, you know, who's your influence? Sorry, I didn't hear your question. <laughs> wow. This guy's pretty good. <laughs> he came up with shit and he's never heard anything. <laughs> totally. You call, uh, you call, you know, your sort of tribe, your family. I, I call my clients at Music City, we call them family members, right? Music City family members. And you call yours what? Rockaholics? Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty cool. See that see that in and of itself is like cool branding, right? Like cool, like it's just a cool thing because everybody wants to be a rockaholic. I want right. to, I want to be a right. rockaholic. Well, you know. Again, um, that's just a play on words. Yeah, yeah. But a play on fun stemming from other bands that come up with shit, you know, Kiss Army. There you go. Right. So and, cheer, and ch cheers, fuckers. Cheers, fuckers. That's, That's a, awesome. Yeah, that was. And you know, one day I walked into Spencer's Gifts. This was like fuck, eight years ago. Okay. And they got cheers, fuckers glasses. And you gotta I be went, kidding. You gotta be fucking kidding me. Wow. I'm like, <laughs> okay. Everybody's like, sue them. I'm like, I never thought of filing a motion to have <laughs> cheers fuckers copyright. <laughs> I, yeah. I didn't think, you know, if Labatt's didn't think about copywriting the bat blue for the first 40 years or whatever it was, why do you think that I would think, and plus it costs money to do that. Yep. And most of the time I thought people were offended by this, but they weren't. They thought it was great. Yeah, they do think it's, you great. know, cheers fuckers. That's hilarious. Yeah, but that's just how it is around our camp. Like, yeah. you know. You got to wonder how much more beer you sold <laughs> with oh, saying man, that on we, stage, you we know. We sell a lot of beer. People just like to enjoy themselves and have fun when we play. Yeah, man. And it's pretty obvious. Like, when we were selling our Cheers Fucker shirts, when we opened for Kiss, I told them, I said, no, you, no we, this isn't enough shirts you're selling. Because it, it was Kiss's merch. Whoever merch is selling the merch for Kiss and us. They said, no, nah, this is what we usually do. Well, when we got off stage, they said, we need more shirts. We sold out every shirt you had. I said, I told you people are going to buy Cheers Fucker shirts. Because there's something about that that, you know, just makes you feel like, yeah, that's how I feel, man. Yeah. Good time, fuckhead. <laughs> <You know? laughs> It's like right on, fucker. Cheers. Yeah, that's cool. And there was uh so what's the story behind because people are gonna find these, I'm sure. That sure they still exist somewhere on the internet. But at one point you guys did this booze and news from the fridge. Yeah, we did that a lot until the fridge broke. 
<laughs> then, and we almost did a, uh, we good. almost did the last, but COVID came. Okay. So we were almost going to do our last booze and news from the fridge, um, marching the fridge out of the shack, <laughs> like good. a casket. And I was going to say, tell everyone that bad news, everyone, our fridge caught COVID. <laughs> you know, just to be that guy. And then I was going to film us taking it to the junkyard where they pick it up with the big magnet and they throw it and we were all going to signal because that fridge is that fridge that was part of booze and news was my parents fridge when i was like four really yeah i've been i've been taking beverages out of that fridge since i was a wee little lad and it just followed me everywhere i went i always wow. dad went take the fridge so it was a fridge from this early 70s but when the compressor came on the lights in the house dimmed right so it was <laughs> one of those fridges so Wow. Eventually it died and that was that. Wow, that's cool. I didn't know that. And I watched... And that was a funny thing, right? Booze and news from the fridge. It was great. There were some of those that were so good. Yeah. Like, you, you have to... If you guys... You got to go check those out, you guys. Booze and news from the fridge. Where, where are those still? Are they They're on YouTube. They're on YouTube? Yeah. What's the, what's the YouTube? Bob Noxious Rock? I would just imagine if you go to... Uh, YouTube and put in uh, booze and news from the fridge. It'll come, <laughs> It'll up. come up. Yeah. <laughs> There's lots of shit on YouTube when you put in Bob Noxious. Oh boy. Especially the RV fire. That one's pretty cool. The RV fire? Yeah. When we were on our way to Kitchener to, to play a show, the RV caught on fire and melted right there on Highway 8. And we let off this, the, uh, the six o'clock Kitchener news because we'd shut down Highway 8 on the way to a gig. And, uh, and actually, if you oh, go to YouTube hilarious. and put in Bob Noxious RV fire, you can watch the whole thing because Daryl videotaped the whole thing and it's since put it up. Oh, it's it's pretty funny. It's about really it's about thirty minutes long, but it's well worth it because uh, oh, there's just too much shit that happens. It's amazing how many people won't stop to help. Really? Eh? Oh man! Oh, huh. even though it's burning. Uh, we won't even get into the Cindy's Law thing because I sat there on the side of the road going, I can't believe nobody's trying to help. So, and that there's my segue for put a fire extinguisher in your car. Yeah. We need, we need everybody to do that. Because if you haven't heard, uh, I'm trying to, um, with the help of uh, a few other people, we're trying to make it a law to have fire extinguishers in vehicles, not just boats, which it is a law, or com commercial vehicles. We want everybody to have a, uh, a, f a fire extinguisher in their vehicle. And we went to Queens Park uh, last, uh, I think it was October, and we um, it, the the bill was introduced. So we got the first step actually uh, underway. So There it is. There you are, Queens Park. There it is. Yep. You and Gibby and Rob. Yeah, and uh, Cindy's husband. What's Cindy's husband's name? Richard. Richard. Yeah. There he is. Actually, somewhere I had a pin I was going to give you. Cindy's Law pin. Oh. I'll give it to you before I take off. Okay, cool. Thanks, man. Yeah. So that's a that's an important thing. So make sure uh, if you do that because pretty soon, hell or high water, that's going to become law and you're going to be forced to do it anyway. And hopefully car manufacturers start putting it in because it's, it's kind of stupid that they don't do that. Yeah. Yeah. Um do you want to you want to give a summary, brief, brief, brief of no. what Cindy's laws? No, you want to no. get into it. It, it where it can hurts. people where can people check it out and support and support it? I would just go to the hashtag Cindy's Law, check it out. I mean, it was a horrible event that happened to a beautiful girl, a mother of of, of th three. Um, yeah, you know, from St. Thomas, she was a country singer, and. Uh, Wrong place, wrong time. Drinking yeah. and driving. Somebody hit her. Car caught on fire. And uh, I couldn't get her out. And if, you know, if only somebody on the freaking highway would have had a fire extinguisher. You know, I've heard, oh, you couldn't have put that fire out. Well, I couldn't have put the fire out, that the fire that was 10 minutes old. But the fire that first started, I really believe we could have put that out with the fire extinguisher. And if everybody had one in a car, you know, we would have gang busted on it and... Uh, I probably wouldn't be uh, hurting like I am. Yeah, man. 
Yeah. I know. I remember you called me. It was like, uh, I don't know how, what person I was, but it was, it was close after. And I, I, we were talking for some reason on the phone and, and you're like, man, you're never going to believe what happened. No, man. You want to bring tears to my eyes instantly. Just, yeah. I just, it's just the worst thing I've ever yeah, totally. watched somebody have to go through. And, you know, and as human beings, you think we'd be fucking smarter than this. Yeah, totally. Well, there yeah. are some. Remember, we were looking up earlier. Uh, it's law in a bunch of the European countries, right? Sweden, yeah. Sweden, Denmark. There's a bunch, right? Germany. Yeah. I mean, I tell people in all the countries I go to. And I I remember in some of the countries, they say, well, that's law here. I'm like, wow. What is the matter with Canada? Yeah, right. You know, what's the matter with North America? Yeah. I got a jet ski. It's in my jet ski. Because it's law. Yeah. Surrounded by water, but you better have a fire extinguisher. Right. Yeah, it's wild. Oh, well, you know what, man? Good on you for, for everything you're doing for her and, and the family. And, and uh, you know, for anybody out there, you know, check out hashtag Cindy's Law. And please support the cause and, and you know, send letters to your local MPs and to Queen's Park. Let's... Uh, help yeah because we're close i mean it, it was uh 20 2020 when it happened september 2nd and uh last october or november whenever it was up uh, we, we got in there and people were telling us man i can't believe you guys got in that quick and i'm thinking man i can't believe some smart guy didn't make this a law years ago yeah totally. Like, what is the problem with oh i forgot we're human beings we're dumb <laughs> so yeah, well, you know. we're but but you're on it, man, and and that's that's amazing. And you know, I know Gibby's a huge supporter of it with you. And- yeah, you know, anybody that gets to know the story, they they they're just you know yeah. they're all over it. So yeah, please, everybody, we've had a lot of support it for it, but we're not done, not done until it's a law. And uh, Cindy Divine, everybody, go Cindy Divine, go, yeah, go Google her name, check out the story, please, and 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 hashtag Cindy's Law and support Cindy's Law. Um, so it's a big deal, and I think. I don't think, you know, she, she, if we don't get that through, man, I don't think she'll be the last. That's the sad thing, you know? Right. Car accidents well, happen you, all the time. My brother-in-law told me, holy shit, man, the other day, uh, this car started on fire and I had my fire extinguisher car. I jumped out and put it out. There you go. And I'm like, there you go. You know, even, and, and here's something to throw out to the, to the, to the world. Even if it's not law yet, everybody should go out today. If you love your kids, if you love your wife, yeah. if you love your friends. If you're thinking of a gift for somebody. Go buy a fire extinguisher and stick it in your car. That's right. Right? Why not? I mean, it doesn't hurt, right? I it, got more wise than why not. So Totally, man. <laughs> well, there you go, dude. Well, I, I commend you for everything you're doing for that, man. Oh, well, thanks, man. It's just, again, has to be done. Yeah. Yeah, so. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um. So, I mean, hard to come out of that, but, you know, speaking of... Yeah, not much of a segue to get out of that. Yeah, but, <laughs> speaking of... I mean, uh, well, speaking of losing things... Uh, yeah, so we, venues. Yeah. So we, yeah, we're losing venues. Um, you know, wanted to talk about that. I mean, it's uh, something that I'm, I'm pretty passionate about. I'm pretty outspoken about, too. Some of the leaders from this town, well, you know, I've talked to in recent years, know that I'm pretty outspoken about this because... You know, I grew up doing lights for shows and doing live shows. I mean, I spent all of my young years when all these other teenagers were out with their friends at the beach and doing all this cool stuff. I was sitting in Harris Park, you know, doing lights for the Balloon Fest and all this kind of stuff. And so, you know, live music is a, is a part of my DNA. And and I'm watching, you know, live music venues uh, in this town and, and in, in talking to a lot of people I know in towns all over the place closing down and you know or shifting into restaurants because they can't get insurance because the insurance now for live for nightclubs and live music venues is through the roof if you can get it uh, that's the other thing some people can't even get it it's well so it started crazy. when they killed the smoking ban right the smoke no smoking thing yeah that was the, the the beginning of the end for for clubs and you know hails to those who hold on you know because there's a difference between a bar, a club, and a venue. Yes, correct. Right? 100%. And um, the venues aren't so happy or happy friendly to the bands who are just starting out. It's going to be very difficult to get into a venue because venues are usually holding people of, of a name. So they'll come in and play your venue. Bars, 
is where, you know, most, fuck everybody I know got their start. Totally. Right? Yeah. Um, so ways around that, that's a tough call, right? But one thing my dad told me when I was in grade seven or grade eight, he said, why don't you guys play outside, start a party? I go, how do you, uh, well, the cops will shut us down. Cops only come and shut you down if someone complains. So if you go around everybody on the block, knock on their door and invite them to a block party, then they're going to feel bad calling the cops if they've been invited and they don't want to go. That's one thing. But chances are they're not going to call the cops on you because you invited them. That's how I got my first gig. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. That's a cool story. So when we did a show back a while ago, we did an FM 96 block party. And I told Taz, this is why we're calling it the block party. Uh, that's and cool. we did it because we were raising money for a poor, poor soul who had cancer and trying to raise money for him. So we did it down at Powerhouse. We called it the block party. I remember that. You got to yeah. think, you just got to think out. Like, I hate the term outside of the box because we're all in a box. But... Just think of other ways to get around, you know, because not every, London's got what, what do we got? Three, four bars you can play? Four now. Yeah, four. Four. That I can think of. Okay. So Real, like that have, that are set up to do it properly. So I'm just going to pick Exeter, right? Little old Exeter. Used to have cars. Gone. So what do they got? Nothing. So where are you going to play? I don't know. So that's a very common theme. Toronto's got still some of the bars they used to have some yeah. right but that's iconic right and yeah. then i don't know how easy it would be to get into lee's palace and all that shit as, as an unknown these days i don't know i don't know either but start there right yeah. start there just hound them play for nothing because that's what we all did we all played for nothing get your tunes out there and uh just be rel rel relentless in it. That that's all you can do. But again, make music for yourself because yeah. that the, the end day's done, and your four girlfriends, past girlfriends, have all left you, and it's just you and your new dog. You <laughs> want to make sure the tunes you're playing to yourself, sitting there lonely on your couch. You want to make sure you go, yep, that's how I wanted that to sound, yeah. and I did it that way. Yeah, because that's what really matters. Yeah, because that art's timeless, man. It is. Yeah, it, totally it is. is. When I listen to some of this shit I wrote when I was a teenager, I can't believe I said those lyrics. You know, <laughs> but that's fine because that's how I was when I was a kid. Yeah, it's like you said, it's how you felt, right? It's huh? how you felt. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Speaking of things like we lost, you know, like uh, you were mentioning earlier, call the office that poster. Mm -hmm. The call the office is done now, right? Lots of them are done. Right, embassy, enormous. Huh? Normas, normas, oh yeah, yeah, lots, you know, London Gardens, yeah. Back, <laughs> late, I'm, I might, I might do an episode at some point with my dad uh, for Kipling's, but you know, Kipling's got torn down to build a movie theater, right? That Cineplex ended up closing, right? <laughs> right, and now it's still a movie theater. I don't even know who owns Kipling's it. Kipling's to but... me was wrong setup to begin with. It was a weird setup. It was like, man, what is this supposed to be? But the but the, but the you know welcome to the music business of two degrees of separation because Jimmy was the front of house guy. For oh Kipling's, well, there you go. Right, Bob. Yeah, sound, but for Bob me, sound I mean, guy, Jimmy. I, for me, it was like I felt like I was going to an eatery to watch a band. Well, it was. I know it was. But that's how it felt. Yeah, it didn't yeah. feel like I'm going into a bar to watch a band and have some drinks. I felt like I was going to a house of pancakes to watch a fucking band. <laughs> it yeah. just it just felt wrong yeah it was it was a different vibe for sure and i mean there was it had its time and it had you know i mean i remember some of the i wasn't old enough to attend the shows then but i remember going er, early in the day when the bands were setting up i'd go with my dad and i you know like all these different bands playing gino vanelli and and you know, the tubes and like all these people the ramones yeah so like all these people that were playing and there were there were killer bands but you're right. I mean, it was a very unorthodox, you know, thing. I just didn't to, feel right, but whatever. To, but yeah, there's a lot of places that are now, you know, gone. And I, I'm, 
I want to, you know, get this on, get this on the record and put this out there. Cause I think that there's a lot of opportunity to be honest. Um, if, you know, if somebody gets the insurance piece worked out, they get all the pieces worked out. I think there's a huge opportunity in cities all over the world for that matter, but specifically in Ontario, I can speak to anyway. Um, Ontario, Canada is, is, you know, we need more live music venues and yeah, but giving I, people but, an opportunity. Right. But I also coming from a business guy standpoint of owning a bar. I don't think so. It's almost, it, it's, it's a tough go. Oh, it is. Yeah. One of the reasons why East sides work so well is because it's not downtown. It's okay. in an area, a community area that's heavily into what it's into that fits the bill of what East sides has for entertainment. Right. I can walk there because driving is a pain in the ass with whatever, right? Drinking and driving and all that shit. You got all the, the problems of going downtown. Now, Toronto's a different scheme. But again, it, when you got your certain communities, you can put a bar in there to, to, to bring in the local stuff. London doesn't work that way, right? You got a, a, you got a community that'll go to the east sides because they live near east sides, right? Per, people from the west side of London don't make the trip all the way, usually, to east sides. Unless Bob Knox is playing. Unless we're playing. <laughs> well, I wasn't talking about us. And so it's a little different than back in the day, right? Back in the day, you went downtown to see a band. Yeah. That's that kind of shit doesn't really happen in Kitchener's and and London and Woodstock's and things like that cuz they just don't have that I don't know, they don't have that rock bar because the establishments like you're saying about insurance or no smoking and all this shit have crippled that effect. When I, when I when I ever thought about a bar, did you ever think about a bar with no smoke in it? No. No. You thought Humphrey Bogart in fucking cigarette smoke everywhere, and that's how a bar it was, right? Booze, cigarettes, pool tables, and music. It's interesting, you know. You sparked the thought that I because that doesn't exist. That that doesn't exist, and, and never will. You know. You know what I think is interesting. I just had a thought, and that is that the intention that you have when you're writing your music about it being for you and about it, but but ultimately about it being fun and cool, right? I think that's part of what's missing. Like when you, when we talk about the smoking going out and all these little pieces like that, it just makes it, it's, it's not cool, right? Like it's not cool to go to some of these places. Like that's what you were vibing about the Kipling's thing for your style of mm -hmm. what you were into at the time. Right. Didn't feel right to you. Probably felt great for, you know, 19 year old at that time, 20 year old women who were going there for the dance, the dance portion of it the no, dance club that's all, that it, was but. back then i felt like it was all about how well they could get themselves done up in their hair and shit and they're going there more not more not as much for the fucking music but they're going there for the party and for to the show party. themselves off and say hey, hey, hey I know that but person. the party is what i'm saying like you're talking about east sides right and about how that can how that that bar is designed in many many ways to vibe with that community yeah. right and and so to me that's a cool place for those people to go because that place is designed for what they're into so it's cool for them right yeah and i go there and i'm from i i grew up eoa but i live in the west side now and i love to come to east sides to the benefits and all the things you guys do um and i think it's a great vibe in there right so you know to that point i think you know what you're saying is you can still build a bar but you have to be really careful you gotta you know you gotta have the right I wouldn't, vibe I, you personally, wouldn't personally i wouldn't fucking open a bar Unless, it, again, if, if an opportunity came like in East Sides, where I'm in a built-in community of... EOA is a rocker fucking end of town. Oh, yeah. It always has been. Totally. Right? So that club will do okay in that neck of the woods because it's easy to go for a jaunt. To go downtown, it's work. People are worried. Right. It's, yeah. it's, it, there's, there's hassles that come with it. Yeah, totally. You know, you can't even park your car safely downtown anymore now. You know, when you go, I think people like going to the Knights games because they feel safe. Safer. Yeah. Safer. Yeah. Right. Totally. But I'm out of there before 10. Yeah. 
and I don't want to park my car too far away. <laughs> so, but that's just the norm. The world yeah. sucks now. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, it's I know. Just I think shit. I, I at one point thought it was a London thing and I talked to people from all over no. the place and they're like, no, it's everywhere. Man. No, it's, it's everywhere. Yeah. I mean, when we played Vancouver, I was, I was, you know, you, you get these wake up calls over the years of playing different countries and different places. You're like, holy fuck. But there's always a, the same kind of theme. So, I don't know. I wouldn't yeah. want to be a bar owner now. So what's the so for the for the guys coming up, but the, the people coming up, um, where do they get their start? Where do they play then? Fuck, play your garage and play your basement and play till you're so good. Yeah, that you start over, right? You conquered the garage, you conquered the basement. Now. Go find somebody to open for. Right. Right. And make a reason for people to come and see you. Not just because you're playing. Right. Yeah. Make an event. I heard this crazy thing the other day. There's a uh, artist manager that I'm friends with. And I said, Hey, well, how come you don't get your artist? This, this girl he's working with. I said, how come you don't get her on an opening spot? Like she's great. And I said, how come you don't get our opening spot on a tour? He goes, well, we have to pay for that. Right. The buy-on. The buy-on, right? This is like, like I'm a lighting guy, you know, a bunch of things. But like I, this is like. This oh, is, yeah. Oh, yeah, man. No, like, buy-ons have always been around for a long time. And that used to be a thing because you would be signed to a record label who, <laughs> they, put you on the, they put you on the tour, but you owe that money. Wow. You owe that money. And um, I don't, I'm not so sure that's a big thing anymore because, you know, record companies. Country. This is a country artist. It's apparently well, it's still I a thing know. in country. Yeah. Yeah. But that, that, that country thing is a complete different market than what I know. Oh yeah. That's a different world right? for sure. It, it, it basically is the rock and roll world all over again. Right. Of the time now. Yeah. Yeah. Because let's face it. Country music today is more like contemporary rock meaning like you know acdc it really is when you listen to it it's like holy fuck yeah it's very if i rough. took that twang 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 vocal out of there you might be able to slide in a brian johnson or sure. you know yeah like let's not kid ourselves that, that the music part of it well and a bunch of those for slide guitars i just i can't stand well and a big guitar. part of the country scene is using session players and a lot of those session players come from the rock world right so that makes complete sense yeah, I don't want to get into, you know, <laughs> I don't want to get into, okay, well, metal guitar players are better than rock guitar players who are no, better no, than I'm country guitar. That. Well, I would, because I know that certain styles are harder to play. Yeah. Definitely. Right? But nobody cares about Ingwie Malmsteen's guitar playing because you just think to yourself, I can't whistle that all day long. <laughs> so, you know, okay, whatever, great, that's super, nobody cares. But when you're listening to... A country guy, really, when you listen to it, it almost sounds like Bob Rock fucking did this, right? Yeah. And is he a country guy or is he a me he's rock guy? Well, he's a rock guy. Oh, now he's a country guy. Well, that country sounds a lot rockish to me because to me, when I heard country, you know, this was the 70s and shit, and I was used to country the way it was, like Jennings, Cash, and Amazing. then even beyond that, like way back. So, cause my dad used to play some of it. So when I, when people go, this is country, I'm like, holy fuck. It sounds like they pulled a country singer out of a country band and put them on a rock band. Well, that's why it's, it's crossing over mainstream and why they're filling arenas now and stadiums. They're right? the new Def Leppard, I guess. I, I don't Kenny know. Ches I went to the Kenny Chesney show in Nashville. See, I don't even my, know who that is. Yeah. Kenny, Kenny. And I went to the show with my wife and it was like, the it was the Nashville the stadium in Nashville, and it was the record amount of people ever in that stadium watching his show. Right, like these are huge crowds, and I, I mean it's Nashville, so it makes sense. But I mean, he's selling stadiums all over the place, and it's so it's it's definitely you know country, and it's no different. I mean, I come a bit from the dance world too, and it's the same thing in dance. You know, there's there's all this cross genre stuff that's happening right between. But it's dance. all ABBA at the end of the day. Yeah, and village people. Yeah. Well, it, 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 yeah. I mean, when I. <laughs> When I did my music conference in Toronto, a bun uh, I think it, this was the last year I did it. it was in 2017, uh, before COVID. 
I, uh, I had the drummer from the tramps, um, Earl young, uh, I flew him up from, from New York. It was phenomenal. Him and his wife came up and he did a drum clinic and he played, he, he was the guy who was coined for, for inventing sort of that four, four disco drum beat and all the variations of it. Which was, I bet I could go into research and go, Oh, all came back to buddy rich. Yeah, well, <laughs> Buddy Rich, Buddy Rich. I mean, I got a, right. I, I got a poster of Buddy Rich on the wall here in the drum shop because I mean, what can you say about Buddy Rich? I mean, he's huge. Right? He played with the Muppets. Come on. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> yeah. Who does that? So, what do you think about festivals? Because there's people that talk, festivals are great. There's people that say that think that fest the festival market has kind of killed the bar market a bit no the festivals had nothing to do with the bar market the bar market means coming to see one or two festivals mean i'm going to see lots of bands lots of people and i'm gonna get dirty and i'm gonna get drunk i'm gonna have a party i'm gonna have a party going to a bar i'm gonna get drunk i'm probably not gonna get dirty and there's gonna be two bands maybe three and that's it yeah right yeah and there's only going to be a few hundred people or whatever, 500 people. Older. I love both. Like, I love the intimacy of playing. Like, when we played Paraguay, there, there was a four or 500 people sold out show because that's the size of the plates. It was great. I could see almost everybody's eyes. Oh, that's cool. Right? In a festival, like I said before, you can, after 15, 20 rows, pfft, it's yeah. a shadow of heads. Doesn't mean shit. Sure. Right? Yeah, yeah. So if you're closer, you can probably see more people it's, anyway. It's all different experiences, right? Which is cool. What's your favorite? Uh I don't know because it would all depend on the, the experience. Yeah, the vibe and everything. Yeah. Yeah. Like when we played whack in, in Germany, I don't even know. A sea of 40, 50,000 people. This was like 98. How do I know uh, what the vibe is? I can't tell what's going on back there. But in a room of 100 people, you know exactly because you can see their face. Yeah. You could, you, could, you could almost feel the vibe coming off each person. Totally. So there's a complete different, right? It's like... Tonight I'm having pizza. Tomorrow I'm having steak. It's a complete different experience. But you recommend both for different reasons, obviously. Sure, of course, yeah, man. Yeah, you get, the you get to the masses off playing off of somebody's back at a festival. If you're the a new guy trying to come up, right? If you can get on there, you you get to, you know, rip off other people's fans. If you're the headliner. The bar thing is cool because you get to the intimacy of that. If you're the headliner at a festival, it's cool to go, hey, and you get, Rah! and it sounds like Godzilla. You know, it, it's all a different thing. It's, it's, if you've never played a festival of thousands and thousands of people, especially when you're headlining, and you finally do that, that's a euphoria as well. Yeah. Right. Do something the same amount of time. You get used to it, but it doesn't mean it's not as fun. You just, you, you know what to expect, right? How do, what, in your, sort of your perspective, your opinion, you know, once you get to sort of that level, there's some people that, you know, are still super humble. And then there's some people that kind of let right. go well, of their head, that's right? Well, that's a dink thing, right? They think they're so fucking special or whatever. Like, is that, that's just all based on the individual. It's not. <sighs> that's just that person's that's peanut person. for a brain who thinks they're better than everybody else or whatever, right? I don't, tr I, I don't think I take things, I don't take advantage of shit. And I, and I. I really love what I do and I, I love every episode. And I got guys like Wiley who say, have fun, man, because, you know, could be your last show. Could be. And you always got to think of shit like that, right? Yeah. Like this could be my last go. Who knows? I could get hit by a bus tomorrow or fuck, I don't know. Yeah. Get eaten by a shark. Who knows? Yeah. No, the craziest totally. shit can happen. So don't take it for granted and love what you do. And if you're not loving it, then get out. 
Because I've seen so many guys go, oh, blah, blah, blah. like, well, then why are you here? Well, some people just like to hear themselves complain too, right? Oh, uh, yeah. I've met a lot of those. <laughs> yeah. Well, this, yeah. This business will do that to you. Stay in long Oh, uh, you get, yeah, sometimes. You get screwed over long enough Well, times. that's a whole different fucking thing. And that's usually got nothing to do with fans or the euphoria of playing in front of people. It's just, there's dinks out there. Yeah. And you're going to run into them. Yeah. You ever had any of those issues with Yes. Like, yeah. Yeah. But luckily for me, I've got some friends. <laughs> so fair enough when there's an there's an issue there isn't an issue for long yeah fair enough so speaking of performing to you know crazy amounts of people in stadiums i'm going to i was telling you at dinner i'm going to the the last ever kiss show your favorite right going to the madison square Garden. madison square it's gonna be great um you got to meet gene right i did open up for him yeah That's he was cool. awesome yeah yeah he was great what was that like? Well, it was really cool because it was my uh, my son's birthday at the time. And I, I told Jane and I said, hey, would you say happy birthday to my kid on the phone? And he said, yeah, sure. So I called my kid and I said, listen, Gene's going to say happy birthday. He's like, what? Fuck off. I, listen, I'm telling you, so don't be a dink on the phone. It's really Gene. <laughs> right? So, of course, Gene grabs my phone and he says, Kelson, this is Gene Simmons from kiss <laughs> that's awesome and he took my phone and he walked off and he talked to kelson for uh four or five minutes which uh, you know wow that's pretty classy right that is he pretty classy. Need to do that shit but he did it so wow full kudos to gene for that and uh that's what you expect when you meet you know someone who you look up to you know and we look up to people for all the wrong reasons really right we should be looking up to fucking people who do heart surgeons and like shit like that right yeah but we look up to the Wayne Gretzky's and when you meet Wayne and he shits on you, that's, that's a horrible thing. Cause you just, it crumples you. Right. So when I met Gene and he was cool, that was great. That's, that was perfect. There's him playing the V there. Yeah. That, there he is, uh, holding or playing, uh, my V. That was so funny. Yeah. It's a beauty. Can I touch it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean the guitar. I'll never forget that. That was so funny. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, who else? Uh, so there's a, obviously you guys have been playing, you know, you've been with the razor thing since 88 and then obviously noxious since 2000, but there's a pile of people, right. That you've opened up for and play for and met. I've and got to meet so many cool people over the years, man. Um, there's D <laughs> yeah, D Schneider. He was fun. There's a lot of guy, a lot of, man, I, I, I don't even know where to start. Hundreds. It's, it's been amazing. What about uh, what about this photo of Dio? What's the what's the deal with that? That was a pretty freaky uh, thing because we were opening SFH. We were opening for Ronnie that day, and um, he had just had a bomb scare the night before. They were in the states somewhere, and so when he showed up, everything was tense. We didn't know, and when I walk into his dressing room, his manager tackled me <laughs> to the ground because oh, no. he had a bomb threat, but I didn't know this. So I started throwing fucking rights, you know? <laughs> I don't know who this guy is. And the guy that broke up the fight was Ronnie. Oh, wow. <laughs> so he takes me, uh, he goes, oh, 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 he breaks it all up. And he goes, I gotta explain what's going on. And he starts explaining it to me. And he says, is this your dressing room? Yeah, yeah. So we go into my dressing room and we sit on, the, on one of the beds and uh, he just starts shooting the shit with me. Oh, and he sat cool. with me for 30 minutes and we had a really cool conversation and it was just two of us and, and Johnny from SFH came in once and it was just really cool because he was really down to earth and he has, he, he, he had this, um, this way of calming everything. It was just, he was a gentle giant. Oh, that's I don't so mean cool. the size of his body. I mean, the size of his heart. He was just a really good guy and he just had a way of uh, making everything feel better. Oh, that's and so cool. It was man. really cool. Where was that? Um, at the embassy here in London. Another one gone. Another one gone. Well, yeah. it burnt down. Yeah, well. Not a not not an insurance thing. Or yeah, no. Just <laughs> saying. <laughs> <laughs> Who we got there? I was Mickey. There's Ronnie. And when I met Ronnie, that was really cool. Uh, you know, Ronnie like, Hawkins. Ronnie yeah. Hawkins. That was amazing. Um, I don't know, man. I could go on and on about the people I met. Tragically hip. 
Tragically Hip was great. Um, <laughs> I had a great meeting with, with Gord, and he was such a humble guy and so nice. And I thought, wow, this goes against all the shit that people tell me about this guy. I remember he says, oh, he can... And then the next thing I know, we go to get dinner at the at the mess hall, and uh, the the chef's going, "Holy fuck, that Gord Downey came in here, freaked out, started throwing food all over the place." I'm like, "Wow!" <laughs> when I met him, he said, "Hey, uh, you're so you're a rockaholic, eh?" And started asking me about my kids, and he got really, you know, into family questions. And obviously, he looked up the band because he knew rockaholics and all this stuff about the band. I thought, "Wow, what a, what a nice guy." <laughs> And then he tossed the mess off. Two hours later, he's <laughs> smashing food and throwing plates. And, well, okay, whatever. Uh, that's, that's, yeah. I mean, we got Bungie's here, right? Bungie did all those final shows with them. Uh, Bungie works here at London Guitars. and um, Yeah. There you go, Steve. Plug, plug. There you go. It's uh, it's, it's, yeah, no, it, it's, it's cool, man. I sad, sad to see, uh, Buck see him. Buck Cherry gone. guy. Buck Cherry. Yeah. yeah. That's a great photo. Yeah. Hey, there's John, Jer there's yeah. John Angus right there. Yeah. Yeah, we've been playing with that uh, Krabi. We used to before uh, after you did the Motley Crue shit when you replaced Vince Danko. Danko, yeah. I love. You know, I still have a Danko CD in my truck to this day. And I Danko sang on the new Razor album. Really? He did so. There's Gordy. Oh, there's Gordy. Yeah. Yeah, and that was weird to play with Jim Belushi because um, yeah, what was that like? great band fantastic just like uh the blues brothers that's so cool they, they were so good and, they, and he was a great guy because i don't know he had many reasons why that night should have pissed him off really and eh? he was in a, he was just first class so yeah that that's cool. that's so cool i get that vibe from him too that's that's really biff cool. from saxon he's the lead singer saxon's a huge band over in europe uh one of my favorites and it was cool to play with him and uh, there's Bubbles. Bubbles. <laughs> uh, that's George from Cannibal Corpse. We did uh, Germany together. Um, I don't know. And then this uh, one. There's Phil from Pantera. Phil from Pantera. What, so what is this? He's well, he's holding the Shotgun Justice album telling us all to fuck off. Fuck off. off. <laughs> that's yeah. amazing. Yeah. yeah, I think. And what when was that's that? That's Voivod. When, that was, when was the Pantera photo? When was that taken? Ross the Boss. Uh, 982. Something yeah. like that. From what Gordy told me, because he took the picture, that was the their last show. They were really? uh, Kitty was opening for him. Okay, yeah. yeah. So that's pretty cool. No, I got, I got a, a, a great gig. You know, getting to meet a whole bunch of great people, and uh, most of them know Razor shit, which was kind of cool. Yeah, that's you know? cool. And I I got to uh, play with Lemmy three three times or so. Lots of people, man. It's just, it's been fantastic. Yeah, that's cool, man. Um, so in terms of, uh, you know, the future with uh, young people coming up, you know, what are some of the things that, you know, uh, that you wish you would, would you know, that's one of those typical st questions you get asked. Like, what are those, what, what's one thing that, you know, you would have done differently? Is there anything? Nothing. Nothing, eh? No, because that's why you get to where you are. Yeah, yeah. You know? You're talking music. <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> right. So. Yeah, I'm talking nah, music. Oh, man, you can't. I didn't do anything ignorant. Let's put it that way. So for me, um, we mean well. We've always meant well, you know? We do stupid things when we're drunk, but everybody does but it's what makes you you at the end of the day. It's what goes on your, on your stone or your epitaph or your fortune cookie or whatever you want to say. So, um, we, we did, we did what we did and we, we, we meant good by it. We never meant to hurt anybody or do anything stupid. So I, I, yeah, I can't. Anything that they should avoid. Um, bad record deals. I don't even know if there is such a thing anymore as record deals because realistically you can you can push your music yourself you can sell your music yourself i don't think you're going to get anything out of record companies anymore unless all of a sudden you become that 
one guy, you know, yeah, that needs the record company. I don't even know what that means because I'm not that guy. The world, so. the world's changing that way too. Even you know, like that whole world is that whole. I talk about the difference between the music industry and the entertainment business, right? Because there's a lot of people out there that don't even write their own songs, and they're some of the biggest entertainers. Well, in mostly the world. country, right? Like country pop. Country yeah. people write songs for other bands and I, I can't even wrap my head around them. I couldn't imagine a metal band going, I wrote this for your band. Right. You know, we're going to share. Like, I just, yeah, it's weird to me because yeah. I write for me and I think most of the metal guys and rock guys that I know write for themselves. Totally. To write for somebody else. Again, it's like what I'm getting paid, I guess. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And that's, it's a business then, right? Is what it is. Yeah. It's, I don't know. It's a weird, a weird thing. If you really felt strong about what you wrote, you'd be wanting to play it all the time. I would think. Now, Lemmy's written some songs that Ozzy has covered, but Lemmy also put the song out as him singing it. Right. Yeah. 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 So, but Lemmy's different cat altogether. Yeah. So. <laughs> no doubt. Uh, so, on that note, to 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 end off, is there? Is there anything you'd say to the sort of the, you know, the next generation of, of metal heads and people coming up that they should do it for fun, do it for yourself. Don't write for s something else, you know, don't go, Oh, I'm going to write this because I just heard this song and this is what people are digging right now. So if I to try this, maybe I will fuck off. Right. Yeah. Do what you do because you want to do that. Cause you love don't, it. Don't do something to try to impress your grandma or the chick down the street or girl in school, fucking do it for you. And then it, it fits your mold. You know, don't be a sellout either. Like that guy that turned down all that money for that fucking song. That's it's crazy. So cool. Yeah. You know, and you, no matter what you do, like if you become a Metallica, somebody's going to, you're a sellout. Oh, fuck off. Yeah. You know, come on. Yeah. They got where they got because they earned it. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. So. Well, thanks for coming on, man. Thanks for sharing your vodka, man. Yeah, man. Anytime. <laughs> How about right now? <laughs> All right. All right, dude. Thanks for coming on. Appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, buddy. All right, everybody. This is Ryan here signing off. Episode three with Bob Reed, SFH, Razor, Bob Noxious. Get online and check him out bobnoxiousrock.com check out all of the booze and news <laughs> from the fridge and all the cool things that that bob and his guys are doing check make sure to check out bob will be playing live both bob noxious and razor shows coming up so make sure you go and check them out and follow on on socials take care everybody we'll see you again on the next episode cheers fuckers thank you for watching music city live if you like this episode like the video and for more clips and episodes subscribe to the channel Feel free to join the conversation by commenting below and visit us at musiccitylifeshow.com.